Once upon a time, a very special mouse celebrated a very special birthday. And he spent this birthday like any of us would. Running around sitcom sets trying desperately to prove his identity while other people watch montage of him in a different animation style. Hey everyone, Dave here, and today we're looking at the Mickey's 60th birthday television special. Dave's obsession, Dave's obsession of the homo. It's 2023 and the Walt Disney Company is celebrating their 100th anniversary. That's right, the eldest of the 450 companies in the trench coat that make up Disney was founded in 1923. And all the other companies they formed or acquired since then are dragged along and given fake IDs to match. Happy birthday, Disney. Your entire conglomerate is still three years younger than the park you took all your ideas from. Still, nobody does an anniversary celebration quite like Disney. Take a look at what they're doing at Disneyland. They're giving Mickey Mouse his first ride. Well, a clone of his first ride. You know, if you don't count the Ferris wheel or the swings. But it's, you know, a clone of a ride people like. I haven't ridden it yet at the time we're filming this, but people say it's good. And unlike in Florida, here it's not replacing any other rides. Take that, East Coast. But yeah, Disney tends to go all out, often in ways that are unexpected. Take 35 years ago when they celebrated Mickey Mouse's 60th birthday with a Magical World of Disney special that is... Well, it's exactly my kind of nonsense. Now, I have mentioned this special before when I was talking about the 35th anniversary Disneyland special, which came out two years later because there is a lot of overlap between the two specials. They're both Magical World of Disney specials that aired on NBC, and they both feature Charles Fleischer and a little bit of synergistic cross-promotion with NBC stars. But this special has a more consistent through-line than that one, and yet somehow it's even more incoherent. As far as I know, there was never an official home video release for this, although apparently it was released theatrically in Finland and Russia? According to IMDb, anyway? Yeah, their Tolkien adaptations had to be made for TV because their theaters are just too full of masterpieces like this. But many people take the special off of TV, and many of those people have uploaded it to YouTube. Some of them including the commercials, which include ads for things Disney would later buy. McDonald's presents holiday huggable Muppet babies. And ads for things that at the time were crushing Disney at the box office. A Don Bluth film, The Land Before Time, rated G. But you know it's not a magical world of Disney special until Eisner tries desperately to be the new Walt. Hello, I'm Michael Eisner. This said the thing! Tonight we celebrate Mickey Mouse's 60th birthday. You know, we've all shared a special bond with this lovable little mouse that dates back to the first time some lucky boy or girl put on this original Mickey Mouse watch in 1933. Ah, yes, dating back to the watch. Before the watch, Mickey was basically nobody. It wasn't the cartoons that made America fall in love with him, it was the watch. So Eisner goes full yogurt from Spaceballs and brags about how much Mickey merch there is, right before a special that tries desperately to play Mickey up as a scrappy underdog. And then the special begins proper in the control booth with Carl Reiner as director Mel Fellini. Nobody makes a mistake on a Mel Fellini production! Obviously this character is named after Federico Fellini and possibly also named after Carl's buddy Mel Brooks, but I assume the character got the job directing Mickey's special because he's a cousin of either Alan Brady or P.G. Bigger Shot. I don't like moose pictures. Only mouse pictures. Anyway, Fellini is apparently live directing through the mirror. Go with Mickey. Go with Mickey. Go with him. Go with him. Stay with him. Stay with him. Beautiful, beautiful. You know how this business is. Sometimes you have to direct a short 52 years after its release. But he's not done there because then he has to live direct footage of Clara Cluck in Mickey's Grand Opera. Cue the cluck. But he gets interrupted by Donald, who is clearly being drawn on a television animation budget compared to the film animation footage we just saw. <laughs> They kick him out, but he storms on stage and definitely does that live. It isn't just more archival footage. Never mind the fact that he's clearly drawn differently than when he was in the control room mere seconds ago. This is all live. So Fellini calls stage manager Charles Fleischer, who only plays one live action character in this special, unlike in the Disneyland 35th. We're moving up to the finale. Get Mickey. Get Mickey. Kill the duck. Really want me to kill the duck? Duck makes a lot of money. No, no. If they didn't murder Chapek when they gave him the boot, they're not gonna kill Donald. I turned down the new monkeys for this! Yeah, but at least he got the new Dick Van Dyke show. Meanwhile, Mickey, who, may I remind you, was just on stage doing Through the Mirror, is now backstage in a completely different and cheaper animation style, and completely insecure about performing, despite the fact that he literally just killed it on stage in decades-old footage. It's all up to you. Let the light in. Not gosh, it just won't work. 
People today expect more. They want special effects. Well, don't worry. I'm sure there's an effects house around here somewhere to underpay. They want magic. Ah, the fact. I see you found it. Wait, that's not Yen Sid. It looks more like King Hubert. Pompous, uncaught, sir. But he does have the voice of Peter Cullen, so I hope this ends with him telling Mickey that his bravery saved the planet. Uh, yeah, you must have gotten mixed up with my pop. You know better than to use someone else's magic. Without buying out their company first. So then Charles Fleischer needs to get Mickey out on stage, and he just may need a hand from himself. I said he doesn't play any other live action characters in this special. You. It was 1988, America had Roger Rabbit fever, and they all came together with one voice to say, yes, we want to see that beautifully animated character drawn way more cheaply. Mickey's on in a minute, and I can't find the cake, and I gotta put it in position! And I gotta get the manure out of Biff Tannen's car before I age 60 years and try to save the clock tower! Side note, this is also one of the very few things Roger Rabbit appears in without a droopy cameo. There's no non-Disney animated character showing up in this thing at all, just non-Disney live-action characters. Although some non-Disney animated characters get mentioned. Porky Pig, who is this guy? But have you forgotten you're already involved in the Wiley Coyote assault case? Yeah. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Roger gets the cake out on stage and accidentally cues it up to explode and then tries to stop it from exploding. Chaos obviously ensues, but really this was just the stage crew's fault for leaving dynamite around such a tune-heavy cast. So Mickey innocently uses magic that's not his to fix it all. Magic cat, fix it all! But then Micris flies too close to the sun. Off with the party! <laughs> Is this haunted cake actually stretching? Yes, he magics too hard and he must pay the penalty. What have I done? What have I done? Ah! Wait a minute. What happened? Camera two. I'm dying here. What do you mean you can't find Mickey? What do you mean you can't find Mickey? You know, I will give the special credit for being one of the very few times Disney reused Sorcerer's Apprentice iconography while actually remembering that Mickey should not be wearing the hat. Sorcerer Mickey is not a hero, he's a troublemaker meddling with powers he does not comprehend, and this weird synergistic special actually gets that element right. Mickey, 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 find your own magic. What am I going to do with you? I get the whole thing? That's not the answer. Mm. But perhaps if people forget that you're Mickey Mouse. Ah! So this is an odd twist on the It's a Wonderful Life formula. The spell doesn't erase people's memories of Mickey, and it doesn't change Mickey's appearance in any way. He still looks like Mickey, but nobody is capable of recognizing this four-foot-tall mouse as Mickey Mouse. Even as they acknowledge his Mickey-like features, their brains are just incapable of making the connection between this mouse who looks exactly like Mickey Mouse and Mickey Mouse. Even as he throws it in their face that he's supposed to be Mickey Mouse, they just don't believe him. Well, you're about the right height. I don't know, maybe it's a prototype of the spell Doctor Strange used on Spider-Man. But part of me feels like it would be cleaner if the spell also erased Mickey's memory of himself. And part of his journey of self-discovery was remembering who he is, as Mufasa might say. I don't know, I just feel like Mickey trying to find his own magic is in theory, the thread, like that's in theory the character arc they're setting up, and by the end it doesn't really amount to much, and I don't know, having him forget himself too would be something. <laughs> I've got a bad feeling about this. Man, Star Tours had only been in the park a year, and Disney was already shoving that galaxy far, far away down our throats. Then we get to the real star of this special, John Ritter. Yes, the legendary John Ritter, often cited as one of the best physical comedians of the late 20th century, a man whose frantic pratfalls delighted many. So this special has him just sitting behind a news desk. And that's the scene at Disneyland where just moments ago, Mickey Mouse mysteriously disappeared in front of thousands of fans while taping his upcoming birthday special. But he gets to annoy Jill Likenberry. Well, Mia, that certainly should stir up a little action. Like all great comedic bickering, it's the utter lack of specificity that sells the almost joke. 
The news anchor framing device sets up a lot of montages of classic Mickey cartoons. And just who is this little fella who has laid claim to America's heart for the past six decades? I assume the news just has full historical montages at the ready for any missing persons case. He started his career as a mere doodle that leapt from the mind of Walt Disney. But mostly from the pen of Bob Iwerks. Because he was fallible, just like us. Well, in the handful of projects where they let him have a personality. They also are used up to set up some of these celebrity cameos. We interrupt the newscast to bring you the following unpolitical, unpaid announcement. Hello, I'm Ed McMahon. In an effort to help find Mickey Mouse, I am authorized to personally hand you a check for $5 million. Now joining us is Michael Eisner, chairman of the board of the Walt Disney Company. But whatever you do, don't blame Roger Rabbit. You know how much it cost us the last time he got framed. But we'll make that money back with the Roger Rabbit TV series we'll definitely be able to do. There's no way Amblin will jump in bed with one of our biggest competitors for TV animation and force us to replace him with a bobcat. They also are used to cut to real-life local NBC reporters showing off Mickey gimmicks. I'm standing here in front of the world-famous Niagara Falls where Air Force One was launched on schedule this morning. Mickey's image mysteriously appeared in a mosaic of office lights on the 59-story Pan Am building. We're flying above the heartland of America, 2,000 feet above Sheffield, Iowa, where the farmers of this small community have fashioned a monument to Mickey, the common man's hero. This gigantic profile spreads across 520 acres of corn and oats. I'm sorry to interrupt, but we've just received word that the Disney Company and NASA, in their first joint production, have launched an ultra-sophisticated Mickey Mouse-seeking satellite. Man, the early version of Mission Space was weird. So Mickey's lost and alone, and apparently he wandered to a bench in Ohio because here comes the Family Ties crossover! Hmm, Mickey Mouse is hmm? still missing. Oh my gosh, it's true. I am missing! What's your problem? Yes, Family Ties, the sitcom that hilariously asked the question, what if liberal parents had a right-wing child? The 80s were a more innocent time for white people. Oh, hi, Mallory. Hi, Andrew. What's your Halloween costume doing now? Costume? Notably, they could not get Michael J. Fox for this scene. I guess Mickey Mouse and Mikey Fox can't be within 10 feet of each other. But it's okay, apparently there'd be plenty of Michael J. Fox over the course of this evening. Next on an all-new Family Ties, Michael J. Fox is back to back when he goes back to the future. Back from the future. He's got to get his parents to meet, or he's history. What are you looking at, buddy? But they do have Alex in flashback footage from an earlier episode, and they set up the flashback in a weirdly emotional way. Alex, you're going to be so proud of me. Andy. Jesse, you're my only brother. If we need anything... Come to your big brother, right? Well, Alex, destiny calls. My dearest brother, ever since you didn't come back from war, it's been my duty to fulfill your dream of get-rich-quick schemes. Mickey Mouse! That's not Mickey Mouse. Why, what do you mean? Just look at this tale. Why, it's a real tale. Well, that appears to be true. And who else talks like this? Point. So once again, like, everybody recognizes Mickey's features as being Mickey-esque, but their brain is just incapable of making the connection between these features and him actually being Mickey Mouse, even when he's trying to disguise himself as Mickey Mouse. And who else has only four fingers? Pretty much all the people you know, Mickey. Mickey's tragic disappearance has touched all of us. It's been a difficult time for his fans. People are exhausted, waiting for news of the mouse. We're calling on everyone out there to help find Mickey. Did you hear that? Yeah. Well, you're yeah. Don't so then apparently it's time for Will Vinton's Toy Story as all this Mickey merch goes on a stop motion adventure to try and find Mickey. An adventure that doesn't actually go anywhere and is at no point followed up on. <laughs> Yeah, we just never come back to this scene. It does not affect the story in any way. It's not even called back to in a fun payoff way. There's just nothing. As far as we know, this merch is still wandering the streets, and this kid is going to wake up thinking his house has been robbed. Suspicion was aroused yesterday when Donald Duck's temper flared during our interview. I guess the merch surrounding the TV didn't feel like leaving. Get a load of that duck's temper. He sure looks suspicious. And watch this. Wait a minute, run that back. Oh, what, so you can see the thing that I specifically set this up to point out to you? Yeah, real great discovery there, Ritter. Freeze it. 
Call it woman's intuition, but I smell foul play. So Donald Duck becomes suspect numero uno in the Mickey disappearance, and you know, that wizard probably could have cleared things up, but I guess he just wants to see Donald suffer. Like most of his fans do. Could it be that this jealous co-star finally quacked up and decided to get rid of his competition? Quack, quack, quack. Donald Duck, this is Detective Murphy. We'll get your feathers down to police headquarters. And yeah, unlike the other characters, Donald is mostly stock footage throughout this special. There's like a couple of seconds of new Donald animation, but it's mostly just redubbing old Donald animation. I guess because his frantic energy was just too much strain on the budget. Although the police seem to be zeroing in on a possible culprit, we are still no closer to finding Mickey Mouse. We have gone to one of America's most dogged and determined detectives. Anyway, it's time to consult with the best detective on NBC's entire primetime lineup, Hunter, from the show Hunter. Well, Dudley, it's a very unusual situation here, you know. Uh, normally in a murder case, you have a uh, dead body, car chase, and a murder weapon. Here, you have uh, no body, no car chase, and uh, Mickey's worst enemy is a uh, talking duck. I'm sorry, I don't do animated cases. Did a tune kill his brother, too? I must have missed that episode. Donald Duck has been arrested in connection with Mickey's disappearance. We'll keep you posted as updates come in. So then we go to the cast of L.A. Law, who make a meta joke about their co-star. I find that me aloud strangely attractive. Eh, too uptight. And then argue over who should defend Donald. We have a new client whose very life is in our hands. Oh, come on, Douglas. Cut their dramatics and tell us who the client is. I'm due to be replaced by William Sylvester any minute. Wait, no, that's only on that other show. I say we give it to Victor. He's used to dealing with nut cases. You can't be serious. You want me to defend a duck in a sailor suit? Yeah, you're never going to get Jimmy Smits to stand in front of a green screen and act against an animated character who's not there. Now, if you'll excuse me, I need to go return a call from George Lucas. But it's out of my line. I mean, now, Daisy Duck was suing him, maybe, but... Insert psych reference here. Sorry, right, I'm late, Douglas. I'll make it up to you. Michael, have I got a case for you? <laughs> and the creep from Veronica Mars gets his punishment. Decades before being the creep on Veronica Mars. Anyway, now we get to the important part. It's been four days now since the mysterious disappearance of Mickey Mouse. There are still no clues as to his whereabouts. Gee, they still can't find the poor little guy. Mm. Now, Cheers writer Ken Levine addressed this scene on his blog 13 years ago. Apparently, the first draft of the scene in the original script was particularly terrible, to the point where Eisner personally called James Burroughs and asked if he could get the Cheers staff to rewrite it. So, a couple of writers from the staff rewrote the thing, and they were paid in Disney merch. Some things never change. But since they all had young kids at the time, they were actually happy with that payment. Hey, you know, speaking of birthdays, isn't today Rebecca's? Shouldn't we be doing something for her? A lot of people don't deal with aging very well. I, I suggest we just dispense with the business of birthdays entirely. Yeah, maybe you're right. We mentioned it, she'll probably just get upset and cry and need comforting and warm. I see a big cake, lots of candle. <laughs> now, unlike the cheer scene in the 1990 special, this one actually did get Sam and Rebecca. But the other one got Lilith, so... I love Sam, but I really love Lilith. I'll have a root beer float, please. Come right up. Oh, uh, sure you can handle it there, big fella? <laughs> Make it a double! But this one has the characters actually interacting with Mickey. But that one had Woody having a ghost girlfriend as a child. God, I really cannot decide which of these is the better Cheers Disney scene. That'll be a buck fifty. Has Cheers had ice cream behind the bar this whole time? Oh, a sorcerer put a magic spell on me. Uh, 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 forget it, pal. I tried that one on Vera last night. No sale. <laughs> anyway, the basic plot of this scene is Sam uses Mickey Mouse as his wingman to try and bang Rebecca. Disney magic. How would you like to earn that root beer? Sure, uh, if I can. All right, all you gotta do is sing happy birthday to my boss. Oh, yeah, this was during that three-season window when Sam didn't own Cheers. He just worked there because he had sold it to the company Rebecca works for. It's, uh, we don't need to get into the full lore. Unless we do. some 
weird little guy who's shorter than Carla singing happy birthday to me. What are you talking about? Why? Why, I think you look swell. Really? You just need a new outlook and a little appreciation. Uh, Holly, you mind? You're right. I feel great. And you're cute. Oh, <laughs> treat you to dinner and a movie. Oh, oh. Well, it looks like Mickey's the one getting lucky tonight. I don't get it. What does that guy have that I don't have? Well, at the moment, Rebecca. I think it's interesting that with all this NBC cross-promotion, the sitcoms were allowed to interact with Mickey, but the dramas just talk about the tune plot happening. Like, they acknowledge that they exist in this world with these cartoon characters, but they can't show them side by side with the cartoon characters. That would just make us not take their show seriously anymore. But all the cross-promotion scenes have one thing in common. None of them are ever followed up on. Throughout the speediest trial in U.S. history, Donald Duck has maintained his innocence despite mounting evidence against him. Emotions have run high. The jury is out and Donald's goose just may be cooked. See, they could have superimposed Harry Hamlin into that footage from the trial of Donald Duck, but no! Anyway, Mickey got from Boston to Anaheim pretty quickly. It's my party and I'll cry if I want to. You would cry too if it happened to you. Jeez, Mickey, how bad was that sex with Rebecca? Oh, man. What? So then Cheech shows up, rocking this proto Jason Manzoukas beard, and Dr. Helen Marsh checks in on him. Yep, there's about five minutes left of this special, and we finally got to the actors who were billed third and fourth at the start of this thing. Hey, I was born to clean, you know? Wow, cast members really don't have work-life balance. Well, what's the point if the big cheese ain't even going to show up for his own party, man? I don't want to live! I don't oh, want to live! Oh, oh, come on, come on! The Mick's gonna show. He's gonna show. This is his old neighborhood, the Magic Kingdom. Magic? I don't see no stinking magic. The treasure of the Sierra Mickey. Hi, uh, you missed the spot. Um, yeah. Ah, going to a depressed cast member in crisis and pointing out that they're not working hard enough. This is an honest depiction of the Walt Disney Company. If all you can do is cry and complain. So then they go into the song that Mickey was rehearsing at the beginning, and that is apparently what makes him learn the truth, even though he already knew the song. I guess he just didn't think about the lyrics. It's all up to you. How you think and what you're gonna do. By the way, this bit of animation right here was reused wholesale in the 1990 special at the start of the Fresh Prince Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious rap, and I'm reasonably sure that's the final major thing these two specials have in common. It's magic! Huh? Magic? It is magic! Oh no! It's my magic! Honest! I didn't take steal it! Take it easy! Take it easy! You found the secret! The real magic is inside you, Mickey, and it's all you'll ever need! Happy birthday! And with that utterly meaningless platitude, Mickey apparently learned his lesson. He didn't learn about the magic inside him from his adventure or anything. It wasn't trying to perform for the Keatons or trying to make Rebecca happy that reminded him about his inner magic. It was just remembering the lyrics to the song he was already rehearsing at the beginning of the special. But, you know, really thinking about those lyrics, man. Really thinking about the magic in you, and it's what you do, and it's the magic, and what you have is magic. It's just the Disney buzzwords. Pure Disney magic, just meaningless buzzwords. The spell is broken. Mickey, Mickey, is that really you? And once the sorcerer lifts the spell, Roger happens to be at the right place at the right time to be the hero, and Donald is acquitted, but, you know, he's still Donald. Donald? Uh-oh. We're live. Uh, <laughs> my buddy, my <laughs> the biggest birthday celebration in Disneyland's history is now underway. And now there's costume characters in addition to the animated ones. Man, I can't wait till my ride finally closes so I can marry Ryan's dad. Birthday videograms are pouring in from all around the country. Happy birthday, Mickey Mouse! Okay, but we were robbed of Mickey actually visiting the cast of Golden Girls. He wouldn't have needed to sing Happy Birthday in order to bed Blanche. Mickey also gets greetings from the inexplicable combination of Burt Reynolds, Diane Cannon, and Phil Collins. 
the last of which would have made a lot more sense to hear from 11 years later. But then we get original Mouseketeer Annette Funicello. Everyone loves you. That's all we get from her, but hey, big cameo from an OG. And the cast of Beaches seems almost prepared for their greeting. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. And that's Mickey's 60th birthday, a classic incoherent mess of individual moments that almost pretends to have a through line, but doesn't put the effort into actually committing to being cohesive. It is an interesting relic from a time when Disney didn't own everything and had to occasionally partner with other companies they had no concrete plans to purchase. All those NBC crossovers in the special really put this in a specific time and place. Now is this special canon in all those other shows? Did the staff at LA Law ever remember the time that they had to defend Donald Duck? I mean, realistically speaking, no. I've never subscribed to the mindset that shared character equals shared universe. I mean, Futurama and Watchmen don't share a universe just because they both have mixed in. But boy oh boy is it funny to think of this special being canon in all these shows. Next time I watch a rerun of Hunter, I'm gonna look at Fred Dreyer and just know that he's thinking, well, at least I'm not trying to find Mickey Mouse again. I mean, if this is canon in all these shows, then this means Hunter and Cheers both take place in the Mickey Mouse universe. And that means Fred Dreyer's character on Cheers just happens to look exactly like a detective he's never met, but... You know, that's not the only time the Cheers universe reused the same actor in multiple roles. Beer and pretzels, that's our game. C-H-E-R-S. But if shared characters mean shared universe, then that means this entire special just took place in Tommy Westfall's imagination anyway, so who cares? Really, I'm of the mindset that at most, a crossover between two shows only makes both shows canon in the show that's hosting the crossover. When David Brent showed up on the U.S. office, that didn't retroactively make the U.S. office canon in the U.K. office, but it did make the U.K. office canon in the U.S. office. So, this does not make Mickey Mouse a canonically existing character in Cheers and Family Ties and L.A. Law and Hunter, but it does make all those characters canonically existing in the Mickey Mouse and Friends universe. Or at least, this iteration of the Mickey Mouse and Friends universe, we know that that's a wide, wide multiverse to explore. I guess what I'm really saying is add a fully functional Cheers bar to Disney's Hollywood Studios, you cowards! Anyway, you notice how my over-analysis of this special about Mickey Mouse has very little to say about, um, Mickey Mouse? Yeah, this special that's all about celebrating Mickey sure focuses on a lot of things that have nothing to do with Mickey. It's almost like they had no idea what to do with this character for decades other than market him. Thank God the Paul Rudis shorts came along and gave Mickey a scrap of interesting personality again. Mickey stopped being a clearly defined character and he just became a symbol. A symbol of a vague, positive feeling we had about this type of entertainment. Kinda like the Disney name as a whole. It's not really a cohesive brand anymore, it's just the mega corporation that owns all the things we like. And yes, most of the things we like, even the things Disney doesn't own, are just owned by other evil megacorps. But those other evil megacorps have the decency to give themselves names like Comcast or Viacom. Well, until Viacom rebranded to just be Paramount, but they didn't rebrand to be like Nickelodeon, you know what I mean? They still have this corporate overlord that just happens to own these family fun, happy subdivisions. And Disney is the only corporation where the name of the family fun, happy subdivision is the name of the evil corporate overlord. Which is part of the reason it gets so much more crap than the other evil corporate overlords. Because it's trying to put the same face on the evil corporate side as it's trying to put on the family friendly side. <laughs> like, again, at least with Universal, they're not putting the minions like on the Comcast building as they're doing their quarterly earnings or whatever. And yes, Disney definitely has some practices that are more evil than some of the other corporations, but not like exponentially more evil. Like, all these corporations would be doing what Disney does if they were in Disney's position. <laughs> so happy 100th anniversary, Disney. A name that has come to mean so many specific things and also nothing in particular, both at the same time. Just like the name Mickey Mouse. But hey, at least you sometimes produce weird nonsense like this, and I like that. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed my look back at this weird synergy special. Give it a watch yourself on YouTube. And until next time, this is Dave, signing off. By the way, since filming this episode, I did get around to riding Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway, and I talked about it, as well as Super Nintendo World, on my podcast At Home with the Dogginses on Patreon. The link is in the description, check it out.